My brothers from the Diocese of Metuchen, my name is Paul J. Kim. It is a great joy to be speaking to you guys tonight on the topic of authentic masculinity. This talk is entitled, Called to Greatness. Now listen, I'm in my late 30s, believe it or not. And so growing up, my concept of masculinity was based, frankly, on the movies that I watched at the time. And the big stars were like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, get to the chopper, do-do-do-do-do. And, uh... Who could forget Sylvester Stallone and Rocky 1 through 100? There's so many Rockies, I can't even keep track. Hey, sometimes when you get hit, pff, when you get hit in life, pff, and you get hit, you, you get some brain damage. <laughs> and then you have Jean-Claude Van Damme, of course. Let's not forget him. And one of my favorite martial arts movies of all time, Bloodsport. Frank Dukes, like, put up your Dukes. Bye. And so watching these movie stars and these characters they portrayed growing up, it gave me the sense that in order to be a man, I had to be extremely jacked and lift heavy things. <laughs> I also had to be able to operate a machine gun and to be able to box in a ring. I also had to defend the dignity of some beautiful woman whose honor I was fighting for. And so I had some grasp or some concept of what it meant to be a man, but I didn't have the full picture. Now, I actually have a background in marriage and family therapy. I got my master's degree in it, and basically I spent tens of thousands of dollars to come to find out that people have problems in life. <laughs> but nonetheless, I learned some pretty invaluable things. And one thing that really intrigued me in my studies was that understanding the psychology that we have as men and as women. Look, in 2021, there is a real push to say there are no difference in genders, but that is totally insane. We are completely different as men and women, and that's okay. We're totally equal in the eyes of God, but indeed, we are different. You know, there's this fundamental question that boys and girls have growing up, and it's directed particularly to their father. Perhaps you have a daughter or a niece or even a sister, and at a very young age, you would have noticed their behavior, especially towards daddy, right? They would dress up in pretty dresses, dance in front of daddy, even bring pictures to him. This is what my daughter does. And what is the question that she is asking her father by trying to make bids for his attention? The question is this, daddy, am I beautiful? Do you want me? Do you love me? Right? This is the question. This is the question that young girls have directed towards their dad. For young boys, that is not the question. We're obviously built very differently. If you remember anything from your childhood or your adolescence, half the time you were breaking twigs off of trees and, and beating the other boys with it to figure out whose MMA skills were the greatest in the kingdom. <laughs> but the question that a young boy has directed towards his dad is this. Dad, do I have what it takes? Do you believe in me? Am I going to be okay? Right? I want you to consider, does that question resonate in your heart, even as an adult man, as you're watching this video today? Dad, do I have what it takes? Now, if you are blessed and you are fortunate, you had a dad who was able to affirm you with that question. He told you that indeed you have what it takes. He showed you by signs of his love and his affection, his encouragement, and his words that, yes, son, I believe in you. I love you. You have what it takes. And if that's been your experience, you are extremely blessed. But unfortunately, if you are from an all too common situation, then maybe that question was actually never answered. Maybe you've spent a lot of your life trying to figure out, do I have what it takes? Because I don't know, me and my pops, maybe we didn't have a great relationship. Unfortunately, this has led to a whole generation of young men who walk around life, and even older men, with a lack of confidence with a lack of understanding of who they are truly, what their worth is, what their strength is, because they have this hole in their heart, this chip on their shoulder, and they're not quite sure if they have what it takes. I can relate to this myself. I love my dad. I have a good relationship with him now as an adult, but I would have to say that growing up, my relationship with him was very tense. He didn't grow up with the dad. His dad passed away at a very young age. And so he didn't grow up with a father, a father who was able to affirm this question. So naturally, my dad couldn't give what he didn't have. And so growing up, I was so hungry to hear the words from his mouth. My son, I believe in you. You have what it takes. But he was never able to show that to me in a direct way. He gave me little hints and clues. But, you know, as a young person trying to figure out life, you don't really have the energy to do detective work. You need to hear it from your dad. And so this led to me feeling a lot of insecurity growing up as well in terms of my worth, in terms of 
do I have what it takes? I'm sizing myself up with other guys and I feel like, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything that makes me different or special or if I can succeed. But I had to prove to myself through a whole series of life experiences and thankfully, praise God, I'm at a point in my life where I do know the answer to that question. However, you might see in our world, in our culture, in our news, a, a whole generation of men who maybe don't know this answer. And because of that, they, they fall into extremes. Maybe you've seen this extreme or this caricature where this guy is just like, he has to prove who he is every weekend. So he's at the bar and he's just chugging down drink after drink. And he's a guy who's, who's getting into fights. And, you know, you begin to ask yourself, is this something he really enjoys doing every weekend? Or maybe is there this deeper ache in his heart where he needs to constantly try to prove to himself and to everyone else in his, his ecosystem that indeed he has what it takes. On the other extreme, you have this type of man who is ultra passive. This guy who is so unsure of himself and his ability to make good decisions or do anything at that matter that he's constantly questioning himself. He never moves out of his mother's basement, right? Um, actually physically or even just mentally. He maybe never moves out. And this too is an unfortunate extreme. And neither of these extremes, the meathead or the passive guy, this misses the mark, both of them. And as we grow older, the question of what does it mean to be a man still remains a struggle for a lot of men, regardless of their age. It doesn't make it easier that the world tries to reduce our identity. It creates confusion about who we are and who God made us to be. In our culture, man is praised when he is the womanizer. You have shows like The Bachelor where this dude makes out and sleeps around with all these beautiful women, moves on to the next one, denies this one, and finally picks one he'd like to ride off into the sunset with, right? This doesn't make him the man. Unfortunately, it might make him an STD form, but that's a whole other conversation. Now, you see, this character though, right? The guy who every woman wants. This is a very attractive idea of what a man should look like, right? Uh, there are more caricatures. Man is praised if he has the most money, the most toys, the most muscle, the most power. From Drake to Dwayne Johnson, from Tom Brady to LeBron, whoever your idol is in life, I do not know. But we are programmed to think, as I was growing up with Arnold and Sylvester and and the like, that manhood, authentic manhood should look and feel a certain way. But none of this, ironically, makes them the man. Let me share where you can find out who the real man is. Walk into your local church, brothers, and you will see the man hanging from the cross. That's right. His name is Jesus Christ. And you would think, well, why is he the man? He's dead. <laughs> but no, you know the story. He laid his life down on purpose to save us all. He also resurrected three days later. He is much more than any ordinary man. Obviously, he is true God and true man. But why is he the man? For us, he is the man because he's the one who came not to be served, but to serve. He's the one who was about worshiping his father, giving him glory. Not seeking his own glory, but seeking to live for even something greater than himself. And that was the glory of his father. He was also about loving and serving his neighbor, not making everyone serve him. He was the one who was pure of heart, who cared for those in need, who worked hard as a carpenter, a construction worker. He earned his wage. He didn't expect anyone to spoon feed him. He didn't expect preferential treatment just because he was a son of God, even though he deserved all of it. This is the one who wasn't afraid to call out wrongdoing and evil. The one who stood up for the dignity of women, who didn't allow them to be objectified and prostituted off, but actually lifted up prostitutes from the dirt floor and reminded them that they were worthy of being respected and loved. This is the one who ultimately sacrificed himself, not only for his friends, but man, even for his enemies. He made his life a complete gift for others. So brothers, it's Jesus Christ who actually reveals to all of us, all humanity, but especially us as men, what it means to be a man in the most authentic sense. Because here's the thing, if we keep chasing after these caricatures that we see on social media, on YouTube, on television and movies, 
We might get little glimpses into elements of this manhood, which is good. But as a whole person, we're not going to find out who that is exactly without that reference point back to Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man. In a world where we're often told this whacked out narrative that masculinity is toxic, and maybe you've heard this before, unfortunately, I think this comes from perhaps a generation of people whose fathers perhaps missed the mark in their lives, and that's not all fathers, but it is a hyper reaction to this wound that they have. And so it's very easy for human beings to kind of overreact to a wound that they have and make very blanketed statements as we or you might have seen in our newsreels and our culture nowadays. But this term toxic masculinity to me is so silly. No one's crying out toxic masculinity when a male firefighter is running into a burning house and bringing that person's family members and pets out to safety. No one's crying out toxic masculinity when a police officer is actually standing between you and a bullet, you know? No one's crying out toxic masculinity when a soldier lays down his life in defense of his nation and his country. I don't think anyone has the right mind to ever scream toxic masculinity in those situations. Now, If it is a reaction to all sorts of abuses from men who should have known better, then yes, I I understand that sentiment. But at its core, who we are as men, our masculinity is a gift from God to this world. Now, I'm not saying that in a way like, yeah, men are the best and like, I'm a gift to the world, baby. I mean, I'd like to make my life a gift, but you know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is Christ has given us our masculinity to emulate him. He's given us our life so that we can emulate his life in service to our neighbor for the greater glory of God. This is precisely it. This is the answer. Our identity is in Christ, my brothers. It's not in our popularity. While we would all like a million followers on social media, it is not in the popularity that we have. It is not even in our level of athleticism. I don't care if you're a professional athlete. That still doesn't make you the man necessarily. Our identity is not in our good looks or in how jacked we are, how much we can bench press and deadlift. It's not in how hot our girlfriend is or our wife. It's not in how much money we make. It's not in our net worth and all the property that we own and all the investments that we've made in Bitcoin. (laughs) It's not in what kind of car we drive. It's not where we vacationed or what else we can possibly flaunt in this life. Because what happens when any of these things get taken away? Think about that. Like, if we're banking our identity on our net worth and somehow we lose our job, I mean, who are we then? If it's in our athleticism and we get injured and we can't play that sport that we love so much anymore, then who are we? Are we all of a sudden nothing? What happens when, you know, X, Y, and Z happens and it, it takes away the things that we built our whole life upon Who are we then? I mean, is our life just simply over? Jesus reminds us again and again throughout the gospel that the way he thinks and the way he operates is very, very different from the way that human beings often think. He corrected his disciples nonstop. I mean, literally there was a story in the gospel where his disciples were talking about who of them was the greatest. (laughs) I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I love about the Bible because it shows how human and how flawed even the disciples were. We're like, all right, everybody, like flex your guns. Let's see who's, who's a, whose fisherman arms are the biggest or who's the holiest in our group or who's going to be the greatest. Like, who is Jesus going to give the most benefits to? And Jesus is like, you idiots. <laughs> That's my version. He didn't actually say that. But he said, what are you talking about? And they were all embarrassed because they knew that they were, you know, basically trying to figure out who was the greatest among them. And Jesus essentially flips the whole table on their heads and says to them, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you have to be the lowest. Meaning that if you want to be great in the eyes of God, you need to serve your neighbor. You need to wash their feet. You need to be like Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve. And so we hear and we see these clues throughout Scripture as Christ teaches us in the gospel, as he shows us with with his own life what it means to be a man. We find the answers that we are looking for. 
And it's great because, you know, Christ, he doesn't pick perfect men. And going back to that example of the disciples, I mean, he picks Peter, who frankly is a huge liability. I mean, if you were an employer and you were to hire St. Peter <laughs> before he was St. Peter, you know, you'd look at his resume and be like, all right, Peter, welcome to the interview. Okay, um, uh, your resume says here that you're hot-tempered. Do you cut a guy's ear off? Okay, all right. <laughs> Hopefully you don't do that here, Peter. <laughs> you, you do things that you shouldn't do. You put your proverbial sandal in your mouth all the time and you say things before you think. Oh, you have commitment issues. You say you will do one thing, but then you run away when times get tough. Okay, well, Peter, listen, we'll call you. Don't call us, we'll call you. So you get this sense that Peter is not worthy of this role that Christ is calling him to. And Peter would be the first one to agree because literally there's this point in the gospel where he says to Jesus after he performs this miracle right in front of his eyes, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. He's absolutely correct. But Jesus says, do not be afraid, Peter. I will make you a fisher of men. You see, Jesus looks straight into the eyes and the soul of St. Peter and sees more in him than he can see in himself. And perhaps if you're like me, you could relate to this story quite a bit. Because while we might understand who the man is, we still struggle to wonder if we are the man. We struggle with our own sins. We struggle with our own addictions. We struggle with our own insecurities of whatever has happened or gone down in our life. And sometimes all that stuff can become very, very heavy where we look in the mirror and we don't like what we see. Or we feel like we are never quite measuring up. And Peter felt that way. He knew who he was. He had a <laughs> HD vision in terms of like where he fell short. And yet Christ saw more in him than he could ever imagine about himself. As you fast forward into this story, he receives the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that tongue of fire that just sat upon his head and he starts speaking in different languages. Peter walked out the door where 3,000 people had gathered. And he said one sermon that cut the hearts of all those people and at the end of it, they all wanted to be baptized. When's the last time you went to a, a mass where you heard a homily and everyone started screaming out, I wanna be baptized. <laughs> this is a powerful moment. And you fast forward even more, Peter was the first pope of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And he would die a heroic death of martyrdom when under the rule of Emperor Nero, he was convicted and his crime was being a follower of Christ. And when they said, we're going to crucify you like we crucified your Lord, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like him. Crucify me upside down. And so historically, St. Peter was crucified upside down right where St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican, is built today. And he hung there upside down and bled out, making his life a gift for others, laying his own life down so that others could live just like Jesus did. You see, this memory of this obscure fisherman is now legendary. We talk about him 2,000 years later because of what Christ was able to do in him, through him, for him, and with him. And because of his example, his yes, because that's all Christ needed. He didn't need a perfect man. He didn't need someone who didn't have flaws and sins and brokenness in his life. He just needed a man who was willing to say yes and to get back up after each fall. And you see how Christ used Peter, and he wants to use you too. One of my favorite quotes in Latin is esto vir, which means be a man. Man is vir. Notice that the root word of virtue is vir, manhood, masculinity. So it's at the heart of masculinity to display high moral standards or to practice virtue. As I mentioned before, we take inspiration primarily from Jesus Christ, who shows us what it means to be truly the man. But as I talked about St. Peter, we also take inspiration from the saints. What I love about the saints are they're so very different. I mean, they all lived in different time periods, different countries, different situations in history, and they all responded to the invitation and the call of Christ, the call to greatness. So I want to talk about a couple of these saints. Blessed Pier Giorgio grew up in Italy in the early 1900s. He was from a well-to-do family. He was a good-looking dude. He looked like a Gucci model. <laughs> you can Google pictures of him. He was an avid mountain climber. Before Pier Giorgio would go climbing some mountain, he would begin on his knees at Holy Mass. You see, there he received the grace he needed to become like Christ, to receive the strength he needed to go and be a light for his peers. He would love to gather with other men and women and encourage them in their faith. And he wasn't just like some stiff-necked, you know, rigid dude. He was a normal guy who people gravitated towards because there was such goodness 
and such hope and such faith and love that emanated from him. And not only that, he was once again from this well-to-do family. His father actually began a publication called La Stampa, which is still in print today in Italy. And so he could have used his wealth and all sorts of Kardashian-esque type of ways where he just made it all about him. But in his free time and with the money that he had, he actually would create care packages where he would bring medicine and food and clothing to the homeless there in the streets of Turin, Italy, where he lived. He was devoted to serving them and their needs, seeing Christ in the poorest of the poor. Sadly, Pier Giorgio contracted a disease called polio, which at the time there was no vaccination or cure for. His family thought he had the common flu and that he would just, you know, need about a week to recover, but he actually ended up passing away. At his funeral, his family, his friends were there mourning and grieving his loss. But then out of the back of the church, all these homeless people started to file in and pay Pier Giorgio their last respects. Little did they know that their son was a living saint. You see, Pier Giorgio was once quoted far before this moment of his death, having said, the last moment of my life will be the most beautiful. Why? Because he was emo? Was he, was he was super depressed? No, 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 no. It was nothing like that. Because he knew that when he passed away, he would come face to face with the Lord and the God who he loved and served all of his life. And so Blessed Pier Giorgio gives us such an amazing example. I want to talk also about another saint named Thomas More. Perhaps you've heard of him. Thomas More was actually a lawyer in the court of King Henry VIII in England. And King Henry VIII, he was once Catholic. Until it was inconvenient. <laughs> His wife couldn't produce a male heir for the throne. So he wanted to divorce her. He wanted to marry someone else who would indeed give him a male heir. So he went around his entire court and basically made them take an oath to say, do you support me in my decision to divorce my wife and remarry? And one by one, they started to capitulate and say, yeah, yeah sure, King, we'll, yeah, we'll do whatever you want. But word got around to Thomas More, and he was asked, and he said, no, I, I cannot in good conscience accept that. And they threatened him. They said, well, if you will not accept this, we will imprison you. So they imprisoned him. And then the threats became even more severe. They threatened to then kill him and behead him. Thomas More had a wife and a family, and he was obviously stressed at the reality of what was befalling him. But even at the pleas of his own wife and daughter to just lie, you know, just lie, you know, tell him that you support him, and then later you can re recant it. He said, if I do that, what kind of a father would I be? What kind of a husband would I be to you? What kind of a Catholic would I be? St. Thomas More chose to die rather than to lie. Incredible. There's another saint named Vitalis of Gaza. St. Vitalis was a day laborer, and essentially he would work all day, earn his pay, and he would go spend the money on prostitutes. Uh, not in the way that you're thinking. <laughs> he wasn't using the prostitutes. In fact, his mission was rather simple. He wanted to help prostitutes stop living that life. And so basically, he would pay a prostitute whatever she would have made all night, basically selling her body and her soul to these lustful men. He would give his hard-earned money to them. And throughout that night, he would serve them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, restoring their dignity, showing them that they are worthy of love and not to be lusted after as objects, but that they were daughters of God who were most precious in his sight. Many prostitutes were converted. They changed their life because of the love and the purity of this man. But one day and one evening as he was leaving a brothel, uh, a neighbor of his didn't know the context of why he was walking out of the brothel, thought he was a hypocrite, and threw a stone and killed Vitalis. The prostitute cried out, you made a mistake, you killed a saint. And at his funeral, there were scores of prostitutes and ex-prostitutes who were there to pay respects to this man who, like Christ, reminded them of their dignity and their worth. So I'm sharing the lies of these saints with you for a reason, men. Because we need more of these in our world. We need to look at their example so that we can be inspired to live our own example in Christ. Here's the thing, when I'm tempted to complacency, to be like everyone else, to make life all about me, 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 I think about Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, who instead of going down that path, made his life a gift for others. When I'm tempted to stay silent when the truth is necessary, I think of St. Thomas More, who chose to be beheaded and executed rather than to just give in to the lie. And when I'm tempted to lust after women, to use pornography, to be unfaithful, I think of St. Vitalis of Gaza, who knew not only his worth, but the worth of all women, that he was willing to even lay down his own life and eventually be killed 
defending the purity and the dignity of his sisters in Christ. But here's the thing, when I fall into sin, when I mess up, when I betray God, and even myself, I think of Saint King David. Maybe you've heard of King David before, the famous story of David and Goliath. And you know, a lot of people, that's their only reference point of David, right? Because that's a pretty epic story. But David was actually a youth chosen by God to become a great king, the king of Israel a leader, a poet, a warrior. He belonged to God, and because he was beloved and called by God and faithful to him, God gave David the strength and battle to ultimately defeat Goliath and to become such a great king that the word of God says he had a heart like God's. But one hot summer day, David made a terrible mistake, one of the greatest mistakes of his life. David saw Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop, lusted after her, called one of his servants to bring her over to his palace, and slept with her. Got her pregnant, committed adultery, right? This was ironically the wife of one of his great generals in his army, and he wanted to cover up his tracks because he got her pregnant. Okay, so the story gets even worse. This is like worse than any Dr. Phil episode you may have heard. So he calls his general back from war. He was literally in battle at the time this was going down. He calls his general back home and says, hey, you've been fighting really hard out there. So, you know, why don't you just relax and, you know, celebrate with your wife and, you know, sleep with her? I mean, this is how desperate he was to cover up his evil tracks. And he, the general refuses to, to hang out and to make love to his wife because his brothers are in battle. His men are in battle right now. He can't just rest. And so David becomes more and more desperate and the king orders his other generals to send this general out to the front of the battle where it was the most fierce and intense and then to pull back so that he would be killed. And the plan worked. And you know, King David thought he was out of the clear. But God sent his prophet to rebuke David because he knew very well what he had done. He knew the evil in his heart. But David had enough sense to repent. He didn't make excuses. He repented immediately. And he wrote all of the Psalms, but the great Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness and your compassion blot out my offense. Oh, wash me more and more from my guilt. And cleanse me from my sins. David repented, he fasted, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and he showed by his deeds, not just his words, that he was indeed sorry. You see, I think of Saint King David here because even despite his great sins, God was still able to have mercy on him and to make all things new again in his life. It's the great mystery of God's mercy. So, man, I think a lot of us can relate to King David, not because we're royalty or because we've necessarily done such crazy evil stuff, but because we've all been recipients of God's mercy and love in our lives. And we will continue to be recipients till the day that we die. So brothers, I hope that this message of authentic masculinity in Christ has given you encouragement, that you too are called to greatness like these saints, who didn't always start well, but they ended well, who were not perfect, but they were perfected by the mercy of God. Before I wrap this talk up, I want to give you a game plan. I want to give you some practical steps on how you can continue to be encouraged in your walk to greatness with Christ. Step one, prayer and the sacraments. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4, 13. We need prayer. Prayer is not just a part of our relationship with God. It is our relationship with God. So if we're not praying, we're cut off from the vine. We are the branches to the vine of this tree. And if we are not connected through prayer, we are going to be snuffed out because we also have an enemy called the devil who wants nothing more than to break us and have us break everyone and everything in our lives. We need to stay connected to God through prayer. So this can be reading the Bible, praying the rosary, praying the chaplet of divine mercy, you know, downloading apps like Hollow, which is a great way to learn how to meditate and pray, downloading a rosary app. You know, we need to pray. We need to get into the word of God so that his words can transform our minds and not the other way around with the culture transforming our mind. We need to be filled with the word of God. But we also need the sacraments. Making frequent confession. I go once a month and it is very, very good for my soul. You might be thinking, that's a little intense, a little extreme. Is it intense to take a shower once a month? Probably not. So why can we not go to confession more often? It's not only there to 
obviously absolve us from great sins, but even small ones, even if you don't have a serious sin on your conscience, go anyways. Because there in confession, not only do we receive forgiveness of our sins, but we receive graces to overcome our faults that we're struggling with. It's a good tune-up for our soul. Also, the Eucharist. Obviously, our obligation as Catholics is to go every Sunday, but hey, why not go an extra time during the week. Because the more often we receive the Eucharist, which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, the more we're going to receive the grace and the strength and the power to become the man of God that he's created us to be. That was literally the lifeline for all the saints. Praying the rosary, get to know the mother of God. Praying the rosary, having a devotion to the Blessed Mother helped me to overcome so many of my sins and even my addictions. My over 10 year addiction to pornography was literally shattered like chains being shattered on the floor because the Blessed Mother was interceding for me. I've been completely freed from that addiction. And I know she wants to help you to be freed as well if that is a problem in your life. But not just that, but any other sin, frankly. Step two, surround yourself with good things. Cancel out bad ones. Pretty simple, right? If you have accounts that you follow on social media where the content is questionable <laughs> or if you wouldn't be comfortable you know showing your whole family what you're looking at then you need to unfollow these things right if you're watching movies on Netflix and on streaming devices or whatever that frankly when you watch these things you give in to lustful thoughts or maybe they're not very good movies and so it just paints your attitude your thoughts in a negative way you know believe it or not Whatever we fill our mind with, we emulate through our actions. And so I'm not saying I have anything against being entertained, but you have to question what kind of entertainment you're filling your mind and your heart with. And so cancel out bad things, replace it with good things. Just simple. Number three, having good friends and mentors. You are the average of the top five people that you hang out with. So if your dudes, if your inner circle are sketchy, <laughs> they're not living out their faith, they don't go to church, they don't practice virtues and authentic masculinity in imitation of Christ, it's going to be very, very hard for you to go on that path. You feel me? And so surround yourself with good men, brothers in Christ. Find them at church, find them at young adult groups, find them at conferences or retreats. I don't know. You know who these people are in your life, so go surround yourself with them. Because as the Word of God says, bad company corrupts good morals, right? But on the other hand, if you surround yourself with good and holy men who are on their road to heaven, it's going to be much easier for you to follow that same path. Ecclesiastes says, two are better than one. They get a good wage for their labor. If the one falls, the other will lift up his companion. Woes to the solitary man. Essentially, this means you need your brothers in Christ to lift you up. Once a month, I also go to spiritual direction with a priest that I trust. This is what I mean by a mentor. You know, uh, going to confession, speaking to a priest regularly about your struggles, your joys, your questions. It's important that we have this kind of spiritual mentorship. I also encourage you, brothers, if you have any issue in your life that's causing problems, if you keep getting stuck with a certain issue in your life, an addiction, a negative behavior, a pattern, maybe some mental health issues, there's absolutely positively no shame in talking to someone about it. I think sometimes we're misled, and maybe this was our upbringing, maybe this was just the message we got, but it's like we were told that it's weakness to talk about your weaknesses, right? That, you know, women do that. Guys don't do that, right? The joke is that when women are together, that's all they talk about is like their inner workings, what's happening in their thoughts and their feelings and the, the good and the bad. When guys get together, we're like, hey, how you doing? Pretty good. How you doing? Pretty good. But in reality, it's not good. <laughs> in reality, maybe our life is falling apart, but we don't want to present weakness, right? Because that's weakness. No, 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 no. Weakness is realizing you have problems and issues and you do nothing to change it. That's what weakness is. I'll tell you why. Because if we don't deal with the issues and the problems in our life, guess what's going to happen? It's going to spill out into every other relationship in our life. So there is absolutely no shame in saying, you know what? I got this problem. I need to talk to a counselor. I need to talk to a therapist. I need to talk to a priest. I need to talk to somebody. Because that is a sign of great maturity and frankly, accountability and courage to say, hey, I don't want this to bleed out into my marriage. I don't want it to bleed all over my children. I don't want this issue to 
be passed on from generation to generation. It's going to end with me. And on the other hand, a positive action or behavior, that's going to begin with me. Because maybe you didn't see that growing up, but you can be the change. You are called to be the change in your family tree. The Word of God tells us in Sirach chapter 15, God says, I set before you fire and water. To whatever you choose, stretch out your hand. Before everyone are life and death. Whichever they choose will be given them. This is a sobering verse from the Word of God. Jesus is basically saying to us, Look, I've blessed you with life, but I've given you free will. And with your free will, you need to choose how you live your life as a man. You can choose to live your life in my image and likeness, or you can live it in the image and likeness that the world shows you, which oftentimes misses the mark. Brothers, I want to encourage you today to not be afraid, to take up this call, to not be afraid to be the man. And it's scary to be the man in a way that the world doesn't always celebrate because they didn't always celebrate Christ. In fact, Jesus said, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. They killed him. They crucified him because they couldn't handle his truth. They couldn't handle his love. They couldn't handle his example of authentic masculinity and greatness. But that's what our world is hungry for right now, gentlemen. More than ever, this world needs examples of men who have come alive in Christ. There's so many people in this world who are lost because they did not have men in their life who emulated what authentic masculinity looked like in Christ. But that changes with me. And that changes with you. Because Christ is inviting us, brothers. He's inviting us to greatness. So brothers, do not be afraid to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow the king. To follow the greatest. To follow the man. Because if we can do that, if we can abide in him and stay close to him, just like Peter did, then we too can become great saints. We too can become the solution to this world's problems. Amen? Amen. Let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for the gift of our masculinity, our manhood. Give us the strength and the grace we need to follow your example. Help us in moments of weakness, temptation, and even the brokenness that we face. Help us to remember that we are not the sum of all of our failures, but we are the sum of the Father's love for us, his faith in us, as he tells us, you do have what it takes, my son. God, I pray that you would bless each and every brother watching this video, whatever their walk in life is, whatever their profession, wherever they live, wherever they find themselves, that they would respond to the invitation and call to be the saints of today. And Mother Mary, intercede for us. Help us to be like Christ, your son, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers, it's been a great privilege to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for watching this talk. I hope it did encourage you in your walk of faith. Know that I am praying for you, and I do humbly ask for your prayers as well. If you'd like to stay in touch and see some of my content online, you can just Google Paul J. Kim. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, all that good stuff. But anyways, I hope you have a great day. God bless.